That's me. Uh, that's a photo of me from NDC Sydney last year. Um, I work as a developer advocate at a cloud company called Scaleway, and we're a yeah, European cloud provider, and we deal a lot with, with storing data, whether or not that's like code or media, or whatever. And I started learning about like how and why we do that as a result, and going down a lot of rabbit holes. Uh, and now we're all here. Before we get started, we kind of have to ask, like, what, what is data storage? Why, why, what, what is this concept that I'm talking about today? Uh, and the best summary I found that I like the most is, is about um, in one of the Sherlock Holmes novels, the, the titular detective doesn't know that the Earth revolves around the sun. Um, he defends this sort of glaring gap in his knowledge by saying his brain is like an attic and he has to cram it full of knowledge. And in order to know this, this fact about the Earth revolving around the sun, he'd have to throw out something else to make room. And he doesn't need to know that in his line of work, so he doesn't, he doesn't keep track of that knowledge. Obviously, things aren't quite as simple as that, but I, I like the general analogy. Like We need to know more things in our day-to-day -day lives than we can fit in our brains. And uh, so we turn them into physical objects so we can keep track of them. And this has been true for pretty much all of human history. So, for example, in the last couple of months, how many of us have had to make a phone call to a number that we did not know by heart? Yeah, like uh, quite a lot of us, right? We need to know more things than we can remember, and we need to store them somewhere. That's what a phone book does for us, or storing things in our contacts in our, in our phones. Um, so this talk is about how we as a species have done that throughout history, and the impact in particular that computers have had on solutions to this problem. The other thing I'm going to touch on is about the durability of data storage, and that has two parts to it. One of them is about the physical medium involved, like how sturdy are the objects that we create. The other half is about the encodings that we use to turn data into those objects and how and if those encodings survive. So nobody get out your phones. Can anybody tell me, without using their phone, where this QR code leads? Right? Um, without specialized hardware and software, this stored data is, is completely inaccessible. Uh, the encoding isn't something that humans can do by themselves in their heads, even though the object itself is trivially reproducible. It's like, like you know, this, this would last forever, provided that we could keep like, copying it. We've seen loss of data in the past due to storage formats becoming inaccessible for, like, in, yeah, we, we've seen this um, in, in examples I'll talk about throughout this talk. And there's a concept that folks who are into archival, uh, they're terming it the digital dark age. And this is the idea that as our data storage becomes increasingly digital, there's very little left that isn't vulnerable to encodings becoming lost over time as the technology becomes obsolete. So I've divided this talk into four sections. We have, going way back into the past, like the Bronze Age, how did people store information before computers? We have got things like obsolete electronic methods, like magnetic drum memory used by IBM, and core rope memory knitted by little old ladies that powered the Apollo missions. Really cool, like old historical stuff. We've got current things, things that you'll be familiar with, like hard disk drives, modern magnetic tape storage, uh, flash storage. And lastly, for a bit of fun, I'm gonna talk about what the future might hold for data storage, some really cool and like sci-fi stuff. So, old stuff. Let's look at some things that have survived the test of time. First up, we have clay tablets. I promised this in the abstract. I've also got some stickers of clay tablets out at the front if you guys want it like, uh, at the end of the talk. These were traditionally not fired in a kiln, so made of clay, not fired in a kiln, but instead left to air dry. And as a result, we don't have a lot of these left today. The physical object's not very durable. Some of the ones we do have, like this one in the picture, it uh, lives in, I think, the British Museum. Um, this was accidentally fired because a guy's house caught fire. Uh, as a result, we know a little about this guy. Well, we know a little about this guy. Uh, his name was Ayan Azir, and he was a copper merchant, and we know that he wasn't very good at it. This tablet is considered to be one of the, the oldest known written complaint, one of a few that were found in the ruins of this guy's house, which is hilarious to me. Like, his house burned down, and then, like, 4,000 years later, we're still laughing at him. Um, this tablet is written in Akkadian cuneiform. That writing system was lost for a long, long time. Linguists in the 18th and 19th century had to spend a lot of time figuring out how to read this language. So even though the physical object is very durable in this particular case because his house burned down, the encoding of the data was actually lost for a long, long time. Another method that we've used for a very, very long time and still use today, um, pen and paper on the other end of the sort of physical durability spectrum or ink and parchment like uh, you know, pigments on papyrus, that kind of thing. 
Again, the encoding is written language, so we have to be able to understand that language in order to get the data back out of the object. This photo is of the first two pages of the Beowulf manuscript, uh, which was produced sometime between 975 and 1025 uh, Common Era. We don't know when the poem itself was written, and this is the only copy that we have. The manuscript formed part of a library called the Cotton Library, after a guy named Cotton who had a fondness for old and weird things, a bit like me. And for a time, this library was stored in this building called Ashburnham House. Does anyone want to guess what happened to Ashburnham House? <laughs> it burned down, it caught fire. Uh, nominative determinism at its best. So unlike with clay tablets, fire is bad for paper, and uh, a lot of the library was either damaged or lost. Um, the Beowulf manuscript suffered a bit of scorching at the time as continued to deteriorate over time as a result. This is all very interesting. You may be thinking, this is, this is a tech conference, this is a tech talk, what does any of this have to do with technology? Now I get to share one of my, my favorite facts with you. Uh, the English word technology comes from the same Proto-Indo-European root as the word for textiles. And historically, this makes a lot of sense because textiles were like the site of technological advancement for humans for a long, long time. The things humans need to do in order to survive are like grow enough food to eat, and make enough cloth to wear, to like, use wearer's clothing or use for things like sails for ships. Um, in, if you look at illuminated manuscripts of medieval art, you'll often see women with drop spindles, that's what that person has, that big long pole. And that's because if you were a woman in, in this time period and you had five spare minutes, no you didn't, you had five more minutes to be spinning uh, like fiber into yarn. Incidentally, this is where we get the English idiom, like spinning a yarn to tell a tale because women would sit together and spin yarn and tell each other stories. Uh, this is the original, the original book clubs. So, in second century China, people invented the draw loom, which is a machine for weaving thread into fabric, and this helped streamline fabric production enormously. The way it works is that you have like threads running up and down, and then those are the warp threads, and then some that go back and forth, which are the weft threads. And each time you make the weaving motion, you need to select some of the, the upright threads, the warp threads, to go forward, and the rest to go back, and then you pass the weft threads through the gap that's created. I promise this is relevant. People need fabric, and they'll make do with boring, plain fabric, but what people really like is fancy patterned fabric. You can make that with this kind of draw loom, but it's pretty labor intensive. You have to select those individual threads very carefully from the warp each time based on their color, and it'll be different each time you make that weaving motion. Now, if only we could somehow turn that, that pattern data and that, that choice of selecting these particular threads each time into some kind of physical object that the machine itself could use to do that thread selection automatically. And that's where we get punch cards. How this works is as follows. When you're picking your threads each time for the weaving motion, there's a little hook that comes down and like, can pick up the thread or not pick up the thread. And the way that it's determined if the hook comes through and picks up a thread is that there'll be a little hole in the punch card. Um, so if there's a hole in the correct place, that thread gets picked, and if there's not, it doesn't. Ones and zeros. You can automate and program the process of picking specific and varying threads for each weave and get fancy fabric with much less work and a much lower error rate. These are programs. Here's some fabric woven with one of these punch card operating looms. And the ideas behind this were developed by a few different like, artisans and inventors in France in the 1700s, ending with a guy called Joseph-Marie Jacquard, and he patented a machine that could be added to regular draw looms and convert them and give them this functionality. And those are called Jacquard machines. The patterns from punch cards made in the 1700s are still in use today. So that's a big win for data durability, right? Um, punch cards went on to be instrumental in the history of computing, as I'm sure quite a lot of folks already know. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The next thing I want to talk about is vinyl audio records. That's because they are the first example of a paradigm that we're gonna see again and again in this talk. You have a spinning disc and data recorded on it in a spiral or in concentric rings, and then you have a head that you can position on that disc somewhere to read data off of it as the disc spins. Vinyl discs have a single spiral track running outwards from the center, and data is encoded on there by variations on the surface of the disc. The head is just a little needle that runs over that track and turns the texture into an electrical signal and then record players read that signal, turn it into noise. Because the data here is uh, encoded on this, the texture of the disc and the disc itself doesn't have like a protective casing built in, you have to be super careful when handling. Does anyone in this room, is anyone in this room like a vinyl collector? 
yeah, you, 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 you know where this is going. You have to be really careful with handling them. Um, we get the phrase, like a broken record, meaning repetitive, because if you have a scratch on the disc, sometimes what it'll do is it'll, it'll cause the head to jump backwards a track, and, and then you, you end up in this repeating cycle. Um, so physically, the, these, these, as a method of data storage, this is physically pretty fragile, and the encoding itself can be compromised by common things like dust or grease from fingerprints or, or scratches. So, now we're entering the wonderful world of electricity and magnetism and computers. We're back to punch cards. In, uh, in, for the 1890 US census, a guy called Herman Hollerith developed machines for tabulating census data. All that data was stored on punch cards. He later founded, he later founded a company which got merged with a few others um, and eventually became the corporation we know and love today as IBM. The concept here is, is the same as with the loom. A gap in the card allows a connection to be made. In the case of the machines that were reading these kind of punch cards, the connection was an electrical one. A spring connected to a pool of mercury through that gap to complete a circuit, which is obviously very safe and unhealthy to be around a lot of the time, right? Uh, something you might notice is this card has 80 columns on it. And this is where we get today's like, widespread standard of using 80 characters per line. If you, you sort of some, some programs will say, no, you, you need to have 80 or 79 characters per line so that it will print out nicely in a terminal. Punch cards for data input were uh, output and tabulation were eventually superseded by magnetic storage of various kinds, which we'll look at now. This is some drum memory. Now we are cooking with magnets. Magnetic storage works like this. You have some surface of ferromagnetic material, that's iron, cobalt, nickel, uh, certain rare earth metals, and you can uh, align them in a certain crystalline structure, and then you can manipulate the magnetic polarity of that surface one way or the other to store data as a binary. Positive for, like, I don't know exactly which way it is, it might depend on your actual system, but like positive for one, negative for zero, for example. Um, drum memory works by having a drum, like a cylinder, coated in that magnetic material, and a head that can read or write to that material, like changing the magnetic polarity of that surface. Data is stored in tracks, which are circles around the outside of the drum. Um, that drum there is, I think, the Sweden's first electronic computer, I believe, or electronic storage. Um, here's another photo of some. This is one from a Polish computer called the ZAM41, which is like a great band name. I guess it's some, maybe that's where some 41 got their name. Anyway, um, you can see it's got multiple heads for reading and writing. This wasn't always the case. Uh, you can have any number of, of heads for reading and writing to this, this magnetic surface. But if you only have one, then in order to get to a specific point in the surface, it's going to need to, it might need to travel quite a long way. And, um, but if you've got more, then they don't need to travel, and that saves you time. The trade-off there is between uh, the expense of manufacturing drums with multiple heads versus the time that you save by not having to make those heads move around the disk as much to access certain bits of the memory. Um, yeah, the, uh, which is really important when you're using this kind of memory storage for the computer's working memory, so essentially the equivalent of RAM, right? Which these were, that's what they were primarily used for. Drums were eventually superseded by hard disk drives for secondary memory storage, and primary working memory, it was superseded by magnetic core memory. And this is some magnetic core memory. This was the dominant form of random access memory for decades, uh, and it was so ubiquitous, it was often just refer referred to as core memory or core. You've got all these rings of, of magnetic material, that's your iron, cobalt, nickel, and they represent bits, and their state is manipulated by these wires that run through them. When you run current through those wires, they'll magnetize the cores in one direction or another. And one thing that's interesting is that even when the current isn't running, those cores retain their magnetization. So this is, this is um, stable, non-volatile memory. Uh, so reading from a core, you can, you can, even when your computer is powered off, you can look at its working memory. But reading data out from this will demagnetize the core, so it's destructive readout. Like you, you can't replicate state um, from core to core uh, because if you, if you read the core to know what its state is, that intrinsically involves demagnetizing it. One neat fact about this is uh, it was heated, not cooled, to make it more efficient. The constraint here is that you need a constant temperature for it to work best. It's a lot easier to heat things up to a consistent temperature than it is to cool them down. So if your like, home PC ever gets too hot, maybe you can like, install some magnetic core memory to take advantage of all that extra heat. Uh, using smaller and smaller cores obviously allowed the core memory to become sort of much more data dense. 
Um, but at the trade-off there is then that manufacturing it becomes a very labor-intensive process done by hand. And for working memory, this was eventually superseded by RAM, which we use today, you know, RAM in your, in your laptop, in your, in your uh, desktop PC. This is one of my favorite, one of my favorite ones in here. This is a piece of software. Um, core rope memory was a form of read-only memory where the process of writing to it is actually done during its construction, like physically threading that wire in and out of those cores is what's doing the programming. The topology of those wires represents the software. To update that software, you've got to do all sorts of like complicated threading and unthreading, and this type of memory got the nickname of lol memory, little old lady memory, because the process of manufacturing this looked like knitting or, or sewing or crochet or whatever, and lots of different yarn crafts, and um, the most famous usage of this core rope memory was in the Apollo missions. Uh, Margaret Hamilton, who's a very famous figure in the history of computing, was at the head of the team responsible for like, maintaining and updating and developing the software that was encoded into this kind of memory. Um, and one, th one thing that made it really useful, like what was very useful about it for it usage in space travel, is that that's very non-volatile. Like you, you can't, like there's no equivalent of like a bit flipping. That would be like a, like a, a thread coming undone or something. Um, yeah, which is, I just think that's really, really neat. So, floppy disks. I feel really old putting these in the historical section. Uh, seen here in an eight inch, a five and a quarter inch, and the three and a half inch sizes. These were the latest and greatest in removable storage media from about the mid 1970s to the early 2000s. They're called floppy disks because the actual, has anyone ever taken apart a floppy disk, seen the inside of a floppy disk? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Like, you know, the, the media that they use to store the data is this, magne is this magnetic sort of, um, like tape, like a uh, floppy substance, a floppy, a floppy sort of uh, thing. Um, like drum memory and vinyl records, they use the spinning disc uh, method. This is what the actual disc looks like for those of us who haven't taken apart a floppy disc. This is the innards of a 3.5 inch disc. If you pick that up and shook it, it'll go like boop, boop, boop. And closer up, it looks like this. Uh, this is a taken with a, I, th I think it's called a magnetic field camera close-up visualization of the data encoded on a floppy disk. Um, the bright and dark parts represent bits of the magnetic surface that have been polarized, that, the ones and zeros. And one thing you can see is that they're not completely parallel, right? They've got a curve to them, um, at, you know, as, as the track is, is a curved, is a spiral. And one thing that this means, and this is true of anything that does uh, the spinning disk method, I believe, um, is when you address memory by tracks, like for, for the purpose of the example, we'll say like concentric rings, right? Um, you, uh, you, you address memory by, by sector, so that's like that pizza slice you can see there, and then within that you address it by tracks. So I know where, which sector my data is in, and then I go and look at what track it's in. Um, here we've got a representation of, of two tracks within a sector. Within each sector, for each bit of track, you're storing the same number of bytes because it takes the same time for the disk to spin across that sector, regardless where within it you're looking. So you can, this is kind of visual representation of what I mean, right? You've got three bits of, you know, here's Lou, you've got three bytes stored across this sector. And as you spin, you'll be checking at the same interval. So on the outside edge, the data is physically much more spaced out. And this is inefficient. You're making inefficient use of the magnetic surface. Um, Apple actually experimented with fixing this in early Macintosh computers by varying the rate at which that disk span when it was reading from the edge versus the center. This required unique drivers, unique circuitry, and unique hardware. Disks written with this method weren't readable by drives that didn't use this method, and it just became uh, economically unfeasible, infeasible to, to, ma to maintain that as a method of um, writing to floppy disks, eventually they reverted back to the constant angular velocity model that gives you this inefficiency at the outer edge. Uh, that is something that happens with, I think, hard drives. There are some people who've done the same with hard drives, like varying the, the angular velocity based on where you are uh, physically on the, between the center and the edge of the disk, and it just it never ends up working. It never ends up being worth it, which is just an interesting pattern that you see again and again with spinning disks. I think some vinyl might do that. I'm not sure. So before computing environments were regularly networked, floppy disks were like the go-to method for transferring data between one computer and another. 
Uh, this legacy lives on with the floppy disks having become the global icon for the save button when I was working on this talk and I was giving out these like floppy disk stickers. I think about 15 people over the course of two days went, oh, you got stickers of the save icon. And they were all like guys in their 50s making the sort of dad joke about it. Um, but, you know, so the floppy disk, the legacy lived on in the save button, um, but all good things come to an end. Uh, eventually, other data storage formats became more competitive in terms of cost of manufacture and density of storage. So uh, by 2007, only 2% of computers sold in stores had built-in floppy drives. However, uh, this article is from no uh, October 2019. If you ever worry that the technology that you're, that you're very familiar with and that you know best is getting old, maybe you need to reskill in AI or WASM or whatever, um, uh, this is, uh, don't sweat it, um, somewhere in the world, probably the US government will still be using obsolete technology for, for years and years and years. They're not quite dead yet as well. Uh, I went on Amazon, I had a gander at some of the external floppy drive disks, uh, like, you know, plug into, a, a, plug into your computer via USB. I couldn't find one with a USB-C connector, but if I wanted to read a floppy disk onto my MacBook, I could. Wikipedia calls floppy disks obsolescent, which I think is just an incredible, incredible word. So, we are now into current stuff. I'm gonna take a very, very brief water break here. Oh. As a side note here, do we have anyone who has never used a floppy disk in this room? <gasps> They're great. You should, you, should, you should get one and own one just to have it. Um, cool. So, uh, current stuff that I'm going to assume that everyone in this room has used at some point in their life. Optical disks, optical media, more spinning disks. So, does anyone here have a PC with an optical drive in it? A couple. Does anyone, have a, does anyone have a games console that takes CDs? Oh, actually about the same, okay. When I've given this talk before, it's like you get a couple hands for the first, and then everyone's like, oh yeah, I've got a PS4 and it takes CDs. Um, I debated putting them in the previous section because like most PCs now don't come with, with optical drives as a default. I don't have that on my Mac. Um, but they are still widely used in, in uh, consoles. So I'm grouping a bunch of things together here under the, the heading of like optical media, uh, Laserdisc, CD-ROMs, writable CDs, all of that stuff. They all use the same paradigm as vinyl and floppy disks. They spin around and something reads data out of them. On optical disks, data is encoded with like physical bumps and dips on a polycarbonate layer within the disk. And then uh, that means that if you want to mass produce disks, you can actually have a, a stamp and you go and physically stamp the disks and produce that texture. This means the disks aren't then writable. Um, but for example, if you've got you know, CDs of music, um, you know, my, the, the Mumford & Son CD I bought when I was like 18 or whatever, um, that, was, that was how that was produced. Then, that's the, then that layer is coated with aluminium, um, but not always aluminium, but a reflective layer to make it readable by a laser. And then that's how the computer reads it out. It's got a laser diode that um, can read, and read the bumps and dips on the surface um, by how reflective they are. So, here we can see the detector, which is um, a, the, the lens from an Acer laptop, opt, Acer laptop optical disk drive. Um, I believe specifically this is a CD drive. Um, CD-ROMs, read-only memory, uh, were developed by Sony in 1984, and it wasn't until 1997 that we got rewritable CDs. This is a rewritable CD, and you can see that its iridescent layer is like an, a, a lot darker. Um, than the one that we saw a couple of moments ago. And that's because the metal that's coating that um, textured surface is not aluminium. It's made of a silver indium antimony tellurium alloy. I tried saying that three times fast. And what that does is it allows the laser that can read from the disc to also melt that metal and change its reflectivity, thereby altering what will then be read out of the laser subsequently. So it can use the same laser to read and write to the disc. Um, but the way that then, once you have done that to the disk, it's very hard to undo that. You have to heat the whole disk up and remelt all of the metal at once and return it to its like crystalline structure. Um, and so that's why if you're going to burn a CD, that's why it's called burning, because it's actually physical heat was involved um, in rewriting disks like that. Um, reading data out of an optical disk requires its surface to be legible to the thing that's reading it. Um, much like with vinyl, they're very uh, susceptible to things like scratches, uh, fingerprints, um, yeah, you can also straight up break them. 
Uh, this is, I just included this because I love it. It's a video, it's a, it's a clip from, it's a clip, it's a screenshot from the slow-mo guys spinning a CD very, very fast until it breaks and then um, taking, f uh, filming that with a very high speed, uh, you know, many, many frames a second camera. Yeah, 170,000 frames per second, which was like state of the art back in 2010 or whenever they made this video. So, um, that's CDs. Now we want to magnetic tapes. Here we have an example of a data storage medium which is not random access. So with all the other types we've looked at, you can sort of, if you want to read a particular bit of data, you can go and do that in roughly linear time. With magnetic tapes, you can't because you have to scroll through to get to the bit that you want to look at. Like you have to rewind VHS and cassette tapes in order to get to a specific bit of them. This is true of, this is true of data stored on any kind of magnetic tape. So the tapes are made of ferromagnetic material, and we all know by now how data is encoded onto those, polarize that magnetic material. The hardware that reads and writes to this tape is called a tape drive. The first magnetic tapes were used to record computer data back in 1951 for the UNIVAC one, and IBM quickly followed suit, set the standards for the industry. Magnetic tapes have been in pretty constant use ever since, despite that drawback of having potentially long access times. They're very cheap. They're very durable, magnetism-wise. Um, if you're not reading and writing to them, that magnetism is very stable. Um, and they also, you, you can physically remove them from the computer in a way that you don't with like most hard drives these days. You can physically air gap your data from a system that can read and write to it. So if you've got data in a data center that's just sitting in a room somewhere, um, yeah, that's safe from cyber attacks, I guess. Uh, however, you might need to wait a while before you can actually access the data that's on it, like if you've got, um, so a lot of cloud providers, and this is, this is the link with Scaleway, essentially, um, is that a lot of cloud providers use these kind of magnetic tapes to store data, cold storage of data. Um, and sometimes there are conditions on that where you need to wait a little time for, you, like I've requested some of my data from the cold storage facility, and there's a wait time because they, somebody needs to go and get the physical tape, put it into a computer, read that data out and transmit it to me. It's not as instantaneous as it might be or as it might feel from other kinds of data storage. Um, but that's an acceptable constraint for cold storage because you don't usually need uh, cold storage data that quickly. That's, that's actually an acceptable way to store your data. Oh, one last note on these. Um, one of the most famous examples of the digital dark age is from the 1975, uh, sorry, 1976 uh, Viking, NASA Viking lander on Mars. He's got Carl Sagan next to a replica. He didn't actually go to Mars. And this, uh, this lander recorded a bunch of data onto magnetic tapes. NASA got the tapes back and then left them in a cupboard for 10 years. When they got around to trying to read them, all of the original engineers, uh, original programmers, had either left NASA or died and they could not read that data off. It took ages, it took like months and months, to reconstruct the data format that had been used to record to these tapes and involved looking at the physical recording mechanism on the lander that they still had. Um, and if people had written down the data format that they used to, to encode their data, that wouldn't have been necessary. So durability of encodings does matter. More spinning disks. Hard drives. Uh, we all know them, use them, love them. Uh, you can get them built into most personal computers, um, unless you're like an SSD-only person, and you get external ones that can fill with lots of pirated media. I looked on Amazon the other day, and it looks like 20 terabytes is about as high as it goes commercially right now. It'll hold a lot of movies, though. Uh, Wikipedia claims that 26 terabyte drives are available. Can't find them. So these work using the same paradigm as floppy disks and optical media. Thing spins around, another thing wins data off it. The medium is, again, uh, magnetic storage, so don't put your electromagnets too near these. Once again, it's an IBM uh, thing that they pioneered. The first two came out in 1957, storing a whopping 3.7 megabytes of data. In the photo above, you can see two of them. They had 52 disks each and one arm holding two read-write heads. IBM kept iterating and improving, um, and they briefly flirted with a model that had one read-write head per track the IBM 2305, meaning that they, they, they didn't lose any time to heads having to move around the disk to find data in specific parts. These turned out to be incredibly expensive and were discontinued. Uh, over the 1980s, hard drives went from being like a very expensive add-on to a PC to being standard issue. Now, modern hard drives have got to the stage where the area of the disks that's being magnetized is actually so, so, so small 
that they risk losing that magnetic state due to an effect known as super paramagnetism, whereby heat can cause a magnetic magnetized material to flip its polarity in areas smaller than 50 nanometers. So for reference, the thickness of a piece of like copy paper is about, is anywhere between 70,000 and 180,000 nanometers. So we're talking absolutely tiny, tiny scale here. To counter this, disks now actually have two layers of magnetic material separated by a three atom thick layer of ruthenium, which is not magnetic. And those two magnetic layers have opposite polarities and they reinforce each other. Um, I just think it's really cool that we've we sort of uh, bumped up against what seems to be a fundamental limit of the universe of how small you can make magnets um, in this purpose in, in service of, of storing data. I just think that's really, really cool. So this is a data bunker, 25 meters underneath Paris, and owned and operated by Scaleway. Um, I, I don't know where it is in relation to the catacombs under Paris. Uh, I don't know how close it is. Um, that uh, this is where we keep our cold data storage. And we don't use magnetic tapes for that. We actually use hard drives. And that's unusual um, because magnetic tapes are better suited in a lot of ways. But with hard drives, one of the things you can do is you can alter the way that you actually write data to them. Um, it's the, there are two different methods. One is called parallel magnetic recording, which is what most hard drives use. And the second one is called shingled magnetic recording. And the trade-off is that you get a much, much higher data density, but it's much, much more difficult to write to that disk in a, random, in, in a sort of random access way. You have to write data all at once um, and then you, can, then you uh, are able to read that data much more efficiently and store more of it on the same disk. Um, I just think it's neat that we've got sort of this, this weird um, method of writing to hard disks that we use in my company and I had to go on Wikipedia and learn about it in order to know what's even going on. Um, right, last but, lots, last but not least, flash memory. You have some of this in your pocket probably. It's in smartphones, tablets. If you've got a YubiKey 2FA token, that's got some flash in it too. They work by using a circuit component called a floating gate MOSFET, which is extremely complicated. It's essentially able to store electrical charge. That's ones and zeros. Um, flash drives have a few limitations. Uh, for a given block of storage, you can only really write to it all at once, not in patches, like the hard drives in Scaleway's cold data storage. They also have a lifetime limit on how often they can be written to because those, those MOSFETs wear over time and they'll leak charge over time. Um, because they leak charge over time, also, it also has uh, a problem where if you write to a flash drive, then leave it in a, in a drawer for 10 years, like NASA did with the Viking lander tapes, it will leak that charge over time and the memory will come, become corrupted. Um, yeah, so they're not durable over long periods of time due to the physical nature of what you're doing to store the data. Right, um, and SSD is a flash storage as well. Uh, the read-write limitations over time are gradually improving, so don't worry that you're constantly writing to your SSD and it's gonna wear out. Um, they were, yeah, that, that's, that's not really a concern, it's just interesting. Right, future stuff, because I have about eight minutes or something left. Uh, we've learned all about the history and current state of data storage, we know a bit about, more about how and why the various types are used for various purposes. Um, all of the current methods we talked about are like, they're probably gonna get incrementally better over time. Like we'll improve that lifetime wear limit of flash memory, hard drives will keep getting bigger and better. But none of that is like cool and sexy. I wanna talk about things that are like futuristic. So DNA, um, it's very, very data dense. Microscopically small cells can hold the entire genetic code for an entire species. A team at Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory created an encoding, the Adaptive DNA Storage Codex, for um, turning computer-friendly binary into the DNA-friendly pairs of A, C, T, and G bases. Um, there are a few other encodings out there. You can go read about them with various trade-offs. The idea is you create synthetic DNA representing your data, and that can be stored very durably at low temperatures for decades. We can do this today. There is DNA data on the moon, courtesy of the Bereshit lander in April 2019. Like, the lander did crash, so maybe that data is actually lost, but if it isn't, then the foundation that built and, and transmitted that data, sent the lander, estimate that that data could still be stable in like billions of years, like, billions of years. That's incredible. Um, so, DNA. I, I was wondering if it was, um, people were storing data in DNA because it's of its ability to replicate very, uh, with very low error rates. Couldn't find any information about that, but I think that's a really cool idea and I'd like to see people explore it. 5D optical data storage. Uh, this, is, this is also known as Superman storage. 
the 5D is a marketing term. The idea of the five dimensions is that you've got like the three dimensions of, of, of an object and then what rotation it's at and how close you are to it. And those are your five degrees of freedom. Um, this is a bit of transparent, non-photosensitive material, like a chunk of fused quartz or, or glass. Um, and you, lay, you take a laser and you engrave it. This is, it's, uh, yeah, 5D is, is a marketing play. But um, this photo above is of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, engraved into a piece of glass in the UN symbol, because you can also make them look pretty. Both Hitachi and Microsoft have worked on this concept. The current bleeding edge of it is in the Southampton University in the UK. Uh, the data isn't, isn't going anywhere. It's very durable physically, unless you drop the piece of glass, which can happen. Um, the encoding used to turn the data into engraving isn't yet settled, as far as I can tell. Like, maybe the Declaration of Human Rights here is, like, just there in, like, seven-bit ASCII. Um, if it is, and we still know how to decode that in a thousand years, we will be able to use this piece of glass to retrieve it. That's super cool. Right. Very last thing. Just to get really, really weird with it. Do we have any condensed matter physicists in the room? Cool, good. <laughs> Nobody here to call me out when I get things wrong. This up here isn't a time crystal. There are no good photos of them, unfortunately. It's a space crystal. And like flash memory, you have this in your pocket, probably. That's silicon. And it's the thing that makes it a space crystal, is that it has a recurring structure in space. This physical structure repeats over and over again. Time crystals are the same. But instead of uh, space, they repeat in time. There, are, there aren't actual photos of them, but we have made them in labs. The, this GIF kind of gets the idea across. Uh, a time crystal is an object whose lowest energy state, its resting state, is one of motion. This doesn't break the conservation of energy because there's something, something quantum physics. Um, they were theorized to exist in 27, no, 2012 by a theoretical physicist called Frank Wilczek. And in 2021, a team of scientists at the University of Hamburg uh, actually made one in a lab. It didn't look like what you'd think of as a crystal. Um, it was a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is a state of matter you can get when you super cool boson gases. I hate when I open my freezer and I've actually made a Bose-Einstein condensate again. The reason that they are in this talk is because clever people think that we might be able to use them as some sort of memory storage for quantum computers. Uh, that's currently an open problem in quantum computing. There's, um, in quantum theory, there's a, a thing called the, the cloning theorem, which states that you can't duplicate quantum state. You can only transfer it. And that means that any read operation from something being used to store quantum state would be destructive, just like core memory, where when you read from it, you demagnetized it and lost the data. Um, yeah. That, which I, th I just think is really cool. Like you see these sort of same things coming up and, and back again. Um, but yeah, I read the Wikipedia article for time crystals um, as it, like because they're under the Wikipedia list of like data storage uh, formats or not formats but options. And I had like a brief moment where I like comprehended it, had an out of body experience, and then I just completely lost it, lost it again. But they're very very cool. Um, and if you want to have a real trip, go read the Wikipedia page about them. So. Conclusions. We've learned about storing data, all the way from customer complaints in the Bronze Age, all the way to encoding data in our DNA and becoming human information cyborgs. It's been an incomplete and whistle-stop tour. Uh, most of what I wanted to impart with this is that humans are really cool and creative, and we're very good at making increasingly complicated hardware. But if there's another takeaway from this, um, it's that data is useless if you can't read it. When we make decisions about how and why we store data, it has to be with durability in mind. Um, you know, if that team with the Viking lander had written down their data format and their encoding, they wouldn't have had to spend months and months with uh, lots of different engineers, new engineers, learning how to read it again. Um, you have to bear in mind all of this stuff is useless unless another human, which might be you in the future, can figure out how to use it. That wraps me up. Um, that, that QR code is not a Rickroll. It is a link to a little form where you can give me feedback if you would like to. Um, and we have two, three minutes for questions. Yes, thank you so much for the talk. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the great talk. Uh, are you hopeful into about the current projects to preserve our data, such as the Internet Archive? Do you think they will be successful at saving current data in 1,000 years? Uh, so the question is, um, I don't know how, how audible that was to everyone else, um, am, I, am I hopeful about projects to preserve data for, let's say, the next 1,000 years, like digital preservation? 
Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting work going on in that space. So the, the Superman storage thing, um, they, are, they are designing that specifically with durability of data in mind. Like That's an explicit goal. And I really like that that is something that research teams are focusing on. Um, I think one of the problems is like we just generate so much data these days, and a lot of it's useless. But there was a, an article that came out recently saying that only 13% of video games are available to play right now, or like you can even play them, and like most of them have just been lost, um, which is really sad. And I think there's, I think a lot of the efforts to preserve data are like quite grassroots and not organised, and as such, they're always going to be kind of playing catch up against the sort of constant churn of data that we're producing. Um, yeah, uh, yes and no. I think there's lots of really interesting work going on in that space, and I think that's going to yield a lot of useful things. Um, I also think that those efforts are probably underfunded, and um, they're not rewarded by our current economic system, so they're going to be at a disadvantage. Does that answer your question? Any more questions? Okay, then let's thank Eli for his great talk. Ah, thank you.